Good morning. John Kipling is not a name that probably many of you know. Uh, he was a soldier in the British Army during World War I, and the last time that anyone saw him was he was charging a German machine gun implement uh, with a head injury already. Nobody knows what happened to him after that. In fact, he shouldn't have even been there. He was rejected by the British Army because he had poor eyesight. But his father, who was well-known in the country at the time, and even is still well-known today, pulled some strings and got him in the army. His father was the author of the Jungle Book, Richard, Rudyard Kipling. And this was his only son, and when he couldn't find his only son, when he didn't know what happened, his family spent time. They went to France. They started visiting the hospitals there, trying to find their son, John. They put out... Uh, 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 advertisements in the newspapers trying to see if anybody had seen John, knew what happened to him. And they never found him. They don't know what happened to John Kipling. Life is full of stories. History is full of stories of people that were maybe well known in their time but have since faded away. One of the best baseball players of all time was only the second best baseball player of his generation. His name was Tris Speaker, and nobody knows about him because there was another guy, the Georgia Peach, Ty Cobb, who basically did a lot of the same things and just did them better. Most of us uh, that know anything about baseball are familiar with the 27 Yankees lineup, the famous Murderer's Row. But how many of us that actually know anything about it can name any of the other players besides Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig? Most of us can't even name uh, the titans of industry. From the turn of the 20th century, Rockefeller, Carnegie, who we pronounce incorrectly, it's actually Carnegie. J.P. Morgan, who we only know because of J.P. Morgan Chase. And Cornelius Vanderbilt, who we only know as a very intelligent school in Nashville that has a mediocre football team. <laughs> Their baseball team, though, is very good, usually. We are at any moment in danger of falling into obscurity. Even the most well-known of us can fall out of the pages of history and be forgotten. The sad thing is, the really troubling thing, I think many of us have come to grips with the fact that, the fact that maybe history won't remember us at all, but we don't want to be forgotten now. We don't want to be misremembered now. We don't want to be forgotten as people. We don't want to drop into obscurity today, and some of us feel that way. Some of us feel today as if we have been forgotten, if things are obscure. So what we need to talk about is everybody goes through this. I would like to talk about today how it is as believers we respond to this. We're walking through a series, as you saw, called Stuck, and we're looking at the life of Joseph, and we're talking today about being stuck in obscurity. We're in Genesis chapter 41, and I want us to talk and take three movements, essentially, each one building on the next. If this is true, then what about this? And the first proposition I have for you today is that everybody feels forgotten. At some point or another, everyone will feel forgotten. Look at verse, 31, or 30, verse 1 of chapter 41. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep again and dreamed a second time, and behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream." 
So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. It says, after two whole years. What two, what, what, after two years of what? Exactly what the cupbearer just related to us. After his, Joseph had interpreted these dreams, after uh, he was imprisoned for uh, being accused of something he didn't do, after two years, the cupbearer finally says, oh yeah, I know what to do here. I got an idea. This event, this dream that Pharaoh has drives the cupbearer to remember something he was supposed to have remembered before because Joseph told him, hey, when you get out of here, remember me to Pharaoh. Tell Pharaoh about your boy that helped you out and I might be of some use to him. But Pharaoh in this situation doesn't know what to do with this dream that he has. He's very troubled by it. He's very concerned. Pharaoh obviously has a very powerful dream. It's so powerful it follows kind of an ancient Near East formula. You have a dream and you go back to bed and then you have another dream and it's very similar. It's not identical. And it's usually uh, kind of a portent of things that are going to happen. And so Pharaoh's a good leader. He's very smart. And because they believed more in the mystical things than we do today, he takes this as a bit of intelligence, almost like a spy or an advisor had brought him something that they had discovered and so he brings it to his counselors. He assembles his crew. He assembles his team. And he says, hey, guys, he gets his cabinet together. And he says, what do you guys make of this? And they don't know what it means. They don't even know how to read it. They don't even know if it's important or not. And I believe, because God is sovereign, that God is probably obstructing their ability to understand this so that Joseph can step on the stage. The only thing they know is that they are failing. And so what they do is, what the cupbearer, who isn't just a waiter, he's a cupbearer, he has an important role in the king's court. He says, you know what, I, I know a guy. He's in prison, hear me out. He's interpreted dreams before, hear me out. And I think he might be able to help us out here. Think about how desperate Pharaoh must be to go to a prison and ask for advice from a prisoner. This would be like FDR picking up the phone and calling down to the jail cell, talking to Al Capone and being like, hey, what do you think I should do with this Hitler guy? You got any suggestions? You guys seem similar. Kind of ruthless. What do you think? This reveals something about obscurity that we don't often think about. Maybe we don't think about the word obscurity at all. We tend to think that means feeling forgotten. But there's another way that things can be obscure. Your future can be obscure. Obscurity can just mean unknown, unclear, foggy. Pharaoh, despite being the most well-known person in the country, his people thought he was a god. His future is obscure. He doesn't know what the future holds. He doesn't know what to do. And no one can help him figure it out. Can you imagine how lonely that must be? How desperate that must be? How forgotten Pharaoh must feel? Again, most powerful man in the world. Forgotten. It's one of those terrible feelings that we get when we don't know what to do. And we, we try. We try to figure out what to do with the future. We try to figure out when we should stay put, when we should move, how we should act, what we should do. We've been told for years now that the housing market's going to cool off. It's going to crash. Still waiting. Those of you who want to those of you who want to buy a house are definitely still waiting. Those of us who own homes are like, should I sell it? 
Where am I going to live if I don't? Even cardboard's expensive these days. You've got to decide when you should buy or sell stocks, and you have advisors that help you with that. Trying to decide whether you should retire or stay in the game for a little bit longer. You're, you're trying to figure out what's the next thing, what's the next thing, what should I do? How should I raise my children to be adults based on the limited information I have about their personalities now? One day they're into something, and the next they're completely not into it anymore. How should I plan to care for my aging parents because one day they're into something and the next day it seems like they're not. Usually it's trouble. Maybe you're in a relationship and you're trying to figure out, is this the kind of relationship that can go the distance or are some of those yellow flags really red flags? How do I figure this out? And what's really frustrating about all of this is that you can feel forgotten, as your future is obs obscure and cloudy, you can feel forgotten by God. Because God's supposed to be our guide. God is the one who's supposed to tell us what you do and where you go and how you do it. And if our guide isn't making any sense to us, what hope do we have? And this is again where Pharaoh finds himself. It's not making any sense. And Pharaoh is at the top of the social ladder. Joseph is at the bottom of the social ladder. Both feel forgotten. One feels forgotten because he has this information that he doesn't know what to do with. And the other one feels forgotten because he's been languishing in a prison for over two years. It validates what we've been told all our lives. You can be in a room full of people and feel completely and utterly alone ostracized, left out, obscure. You can be the most important person in the world or the least. It doesn't matter. When our pathway feels obscure, when you don't know where to go, you can feel stuck in obscurity. You can feel stuck in obscurity. So what do we do? What do we do when it's not clear what you should do? As many of y'all know, and I reference him quite a bit, one of my favorite musicians is Andrew Peterson. We sing one of his songs here quite a bit. Uh, and, and, and the song that we sing uh, is, is wonderful. I enjoy every time we sing it. Is he worthy is the song. It took me a minute to get there. I was trying to, I was like, what was it again? But there's another song on another album earlier on that he uh, has called The Silence of God. And basically he wrestles with what do you do when, you, when you're praying and you're hurting and you're languishing and you're trying to figure out what it is God wants from you and there's just dead silence. And in the last verse, he, his answer, I guess, is that he points you to a monastery in Kentucky, which is if there is an obscure place to put a monastery, Kentucky would be on the list of obscure places. But inside this monastery, in the gardens, there is a statue of Jesus praying in Gethsemane. And this is the picture here. It's one of the most striking statues I've ever seen of Jesus praying in Gethsemane because he doesn't look comfortable. It genuinely communicates the anguish and the loneliness and the fear. You see, Jesus was facing a lonely, obscure night that night. His future was obscure. Yes, he's the son of God. Yes, he knows what the future holds. But he was about to go through something. He was going to be completely cut off from God. Abandoned, forsaken. And he asks God to let that cup pass from him. And he is met with silence. His friends are asleep. And he's in a garden that, frankly, none of us would know. Gethsemane would mean nothing to any of us had the Son of God not wrestled with obscurity there that night. And so this tells us exactly what we do. When you are feeling this cloudiness about your future, when you feel forgotten, when you feel abandoned, when you feel alone, there's much you can do, but the first thing you should do is you go in prayer to the Lord and say, Jesus, you know what this is like. You may not be answering me right now, but I know you know what this is like. 
and I know that you are with me. And I know that's a statement of faith. But it has to start there. It has to start with this confession that you know what I'm going through. And then, and this is not an easy thing to do, you keep doing the things that you know you're supposed to do. There are certain things about the Christian life, there are certain ways of living that don't change, whether you are the most famous, well-known person in the world or whether you're the most obscure. doesn't matter. Being in the Word, being in prayer, being in community, being together, meditation, sometimes fasting, all this stuff, these are disciplines that are timeless. And you keep doing those things but all motivated out of this place of acknowledging that Jesus knows what it's like to be where you are and leaning into that and letting that be the motivator for the disciplines that you're taking. If you try to do the disciplines without first acknowledging that Jesus is with you, they will feel dry, they will feel burdensome, It'll feel like drinking chalk when you're already thirsty. You first have to go to Christ, then the disciplines, not the other way around. So if I'm forgotten, Travis, what what then? Well, the good news is, based on what we just said, if there's work to be done, being forgotten doesn't necessarily mean you're useless. Being forgotten doesn't mean you're useless. Not at all. Let's look at verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Skip down to verse 25, because he's just going to recap the dream we already read about. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be a very severe famine. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years, and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities, and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish through the famine. Into this moment of obscurity steps an obscure man. And he tells Pharaoh, I cannot help you, but God can. God will give you a favorable answer. This favorable answer is not a, a God's going to tell you this good thing that's going to happen. No. He's saying that God is going to alleviate the obscurity that you fear. He's going to lift the cloud from your eyes. And he has so much confidence, not in himself, But in the Lord, he says, God is going to be the one that takes care of you here. God is going to deliver you. And Pharaoh recounts the dream to Joseph. Tells him everything. And Joseph, interestingly enough, uh, uh, chooses a certain way to interpret. Now, one of the ways he could interpret it would say, you know what, Pharaoh? This means this. This means this. This means this. You're welcome. Decide what to do. You're wise. You're smart. You've got the secret. You figure it out. But Joseph goes a step further. One, he recognizes that Pharaoh is a world leader. He's a busy man. So he cuts out all the fluff. He doesn't tell him what the east wind means. He doesn't tell him what the Nile means. He tells him only the parts of the dream that he really needs to know to understand what to do. And then he tells Pharaoh, 
here's what I think you should do in light of what was just revealed to you. First, you don't have time to waste trying to change God's mind. We don't have time to rip our clothes, dump ashes on our head, do the whole grieving thing. We got to get to work. And here's what I think you should do. You should appoint the smartest man you can find and put him in charge of the Department of Agriculture for the next 14 years and let him take care of it. That's his plan. And this shows us, again, just because you're forgotten, just because you're in obscurity, doesn't mean you're useless. Joseph is largely forgotten by the entire world. His dad thinks he's dead. His brothers know he's enslaved or think he's dead. His former master thinks he's languishing away in prison. His ticket out of prison, the cupbearer, conveniently forgets for two years the help that he got while in prison. The only person that remotely acknowledges him is the captain of the guard, and it might be just because the captain of the guard is like, hey, I could either do my job or this guy who's really competent could do my job for me. I'm going hey, to let him do it. And it seems like he's forgotten by God. But he's not, and he's clearly not useless because God is using this time to get him ready, to make him useful. God is using this time of loneliness, obscurity, relegation, the sidelines of life to shape and hone and mold Joseph into being the man of God he needs to be. As Pharaoh had him cleaned up before he appeared before him, God is cleaning up Joseph spiritually for his big moment, for this moment of time where he is going to be put on the stage and be a spokesperson for God. Joseph is a completely different person than the person we first meet when we're reading. How do we know this? Look at the way he interacts with dreams. Every dream he has to interact with are like mile markers in his maturity. The first dream is ones that he has. And both of these dreams he responds to in a way of immaturity. He's like, ah, oh, look at me. Look how great I'm going to be. You guys are all going to be bowing to me. It's going to be fantastic. And they fix that for him. They put him on a bus to somewhere else. The second dream he encounters is the cupbearer and the baker. And he is faithful in interpreting them. He points to God's glory. He says, this is, this is what God is going to do for you. But he's got a little bit of his dad in him, that Jacob working an angle thing, and he's like, hey, cupbearer, when you're back in your position, can you hook me up? Can you remember me? He's working an angle. But in this situation, notice what he does. He offers Pharaoh the interpretation, and then he does not put himself forward. He says, Pharaoh, you're wise. You need to appoint somebody that can do the job. He doesn't put himself forward. He doesn't say, hey, I know a guy. This is my resume. Here's my card. You could use me. I know a thing or two about grain. He has grown in maturity. He has been honed by God. And God's craftsmanship has proven equal to the task. I know there are many of you in this room that feel like for, you've forgotten. Either because you've aged out or because you haven't reached that point yet or whatever it might be. You feel like you're in obscurity. You feel like you're on the sidelines of life and life is just zipping right on by. And everybody else is in the fast lane and you're in a smart car just trying to go. God does not make things that are wasted. Jesus said he has come to give us life and give it to what? The full. Not a half measure, not a part. Maybe you're scared. Maybe you're scared that if you make a move, it'll be disastrous. Maybe you're afraid that if you do make the move, you're going to miss out on an opportunity where you currently are. Maybe you're afraid that if you stay where you are, because you've picked the wrong job, the wrong degree, the wrong spouse, the wrong life, that if you stay where you are, you're going to be abandoned, you're going to be forgotten about, you're going to live your life languishing away as if somebody in prison... One of my favorite baseball players is somebody probably none of you have ever heard of, which fits the theme. His name is Francisco Cabrera. 
And he played for the Atlanta Braves from 1990 to 1993. He struck out three times as often as he walked. And in 1992, he had 12 at-bats in the regular season. His 13th at-bat came in the National League Championship Series in Game 7 of the NLCS against the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Braves had two men on and were down by one run. And any Atlanta Braves fan that was alive then can tell you exactly where they were when they heard the call. Swung line drive left field. One run is in. Here comes Bream. Here comes the throw to the plate. He is safe. Braves win. Braves win. Braves win. I know that because it was my ringtone for a while. <laughs> Sid Bream, the slowest first baseman in history, beat out a throw from none other than Barry Bonds. And Francisco Cabrera delivered an iconic Atlanta sports memory. But most people don't know who he is. He spent years of his life perfecting his swing, riding a minor league bus, getting minor league pay. Like I said, he had 12 at-bats all of 1992. For 162 games, he sat and watched other people play the game that he loved. And for all that preparation came through on a night in October in 1992. God may be doing something in your life, getting you ready for your Francisco Cabrera moment, that one shining moment, that one thing that he's working. Everything may be leading to that point. I understand the fear that you have, that you may not have your moment in the sun, but what does it matter if God is preparing you for his moment in the sun to be shined through you? What if it's not so much what you do, but the people you raise? What if generations after you forget who you are, but they're able to look back and be like, you know what, our families followed Jesus since the 20s of 2020, and for some reason we've always done it. It's because of you. What if there's somebody that you are meeting with, talking with, discipling, encouraging, who's going to go on? And then they're going to have people that go on and go on and go on. Keep trusting in the Lord. Keep doing the things that a disciple does. Keep following the Lord. Keep doing the everyday things. Don't skip out on your time with the Lord. Don't skip out on prayer. Don't skip out on following Christ. Keep practicing for your one moment because God's craftsmanship does not fail when it is tested. Obscurity does not mean uselessness. It's not wasted time. But there is a potential pitfall here that we need to be aware of. There is an idol that many of us run to. And it's confusing usefulness with being essential. And that's where we end today. Useful does not mean essential. Look at verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my family shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out before him, Bow the knee. And thus he set him over the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphonath Paneah. I'm glad we stick with Joseph. And he gave him in marriage to Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And so Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Skip down to verse 50. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second child he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Joseph goes from absolute rags to absolute riches in one chapter. Pharaoh says it's because he's so discerning. 
Pharaoh says it's because he's so wise. He puts a ring on his hand. He gives him new clothes. The, the clo- coat of many clo- colors that his father gave him is replaced with a gold chain and linen garments. He's given a new name. He's given a wife. He's given a job. He's given a place of authority. And let me ask you this. Do you think that Pharaoh did this because he just really liked Joseph? He was like, that kid, something about him. I like him. Let's make him ruler. No. Do you think he did it because he felt bad for Joseph? He's like, oh, poor guy. He's been in prison a long time. No. It's because he was useful. It's because he was useful. Joseph got everything he had because he was useful. Pharaoh's a smart manager. He appointed somebody who could do the job. What do you think would have happened to Joseph if the seven years of of abundance wound up only being three? Best case scenario, probably back in the prison where they found him. And Joseph knows that he is only useful because what God is doing through him. How do we know this? Well, look at what he names his kids. He names his one first son, Manasseh. He says, God has lifted me up. He's raised me out of this awful pit that I was in. He's made me forgot all these things that happened to me, the abuse, the, the selling into slavery, the terrible things that happened. God has redeemed that. And then his second son, he says, God has made me abundant where I am. He's worked in me and he's working now. And y'all, this is when names meant something. It's not like him and Potiphar, or not Potiphar, him and, uh, what's her name, Asenath, went through a baby book and was like, man, Ephraim, that's a cute name. We get that monogrammed on something in blue. It's going to be really cute. Maybe write it on some papyrus, put it above his crib. Names meant something. These are statements of faith by Joseph. He's saying, this is what I believe. This is what God has done. He recognizes that being useful doesn't mean essential. Most of the people in our lives, the moment we stop being value added to them, we'll find out that they have other places and other things to do. They'll move on. It's sad, it really is, but it's true. Start struggling with something, start making mistakes, start developing an odd political opinion, and you will find the people around you, your circle of friends gets smaller and smaller. Your employer will have less use for you. And everybody does this. We all like to travel light. We've been taught, again, cut toxic people out of your life. You need to make sure that you're surrounded by people who validate you and all this stuff. But we seem to think that just because we're useful to people, we're essential. We seem to think that somebody finds us useful and they couldn't make it without us. People, there are unemployment lines, divorce courts, and political rallies full of people that thought their spouse, their career, or their job, their place of employment, or their country couldn't make it without them. Useful does not mean essential. And we worship that idea. We worship the idea of being essential. But you know what's amazing about this? The most beautiful thing about this is there is one person in all the world, all the universe, who doesn't need you at all. You are not essential to him at all. And it is God himself. And he desires you. He wants you. Not because you're useful. He can do everything he needs to do. He is completely self-sufficient without you. Anything he wants to accomplish in this universe, he can just speak it and it will happen. He does not need us. We are not useful to him in an essential sense. We're not the highway for him. We're the scenic route of wanting to get things done. But so many of us would rather have a useful relationship to God. We'd rather be useful to God than have a relationship with Him. We'd rather be an employee than His child. That's a little too personal for us. It's a little too close, God. You know what most of you struggled with on Father's Day? What do you get for the man who has everything? God has everything. What do you get Him? You get Him yourself. You bring him your heart. Because the truth of the matter is, we were a lot like Joseph. 
We were in a prison of our own making. We were a prison of our own sin. Locked away and forgotten about. And God sends his supremely valuable son. Pharaoh elevates Joseph through his own authority. And he gives him a robe. He gives him a cloak. He gives him all things. All out of his own authority. But Jesus lays down his authority, goes into the prison, becomes a prisoner of sin and slavery himself, is crucified, is buried, so that we can be lifted up, so that we can be set free, so that we don't have a live a life of eternal obscurity. And all you have to do is go to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, you love me because, not because I am useful, but because you just do. And so many of us have a hard time with that. You know what's not useful? The Mona Lisa. It has zero use. I mean, maybe it's a poster in a college dorm. And that's not even the real one. What about the Statue of David? Also useless. I mean, could you imagine us having like the Statue of David in the foyer over here? Excuse me, the narthex. It'd be really odd. It's also very large but they are immensely valuable. They're supremely worth so much. Rudyard Kipling, after he had come to terms with the fact that his son wasn't coming back, became very involved in what we now have as the modern movement to identify and remember both those who are missing in action and things like Tombs of the Unknown Soldier. And so because of that, in Britain, every single unknown soldier's grave that they can't identify has an inscription that Kipling wrote in the United Kingdom. It's known only to God. There are some of you, there's some of us who are going to live our lives and you're going to feel like I'm known only to God. People. That's the only one you need to be known by. That's the only one you need to be remembered by. And if he remembers you, you are known, loved, and cherished. Everybody at some point feels forgotten, but that doesn't mean you're useless. It doesn't, certainly doesn't mean you're worthless. It also doesn't mean you're essential, and that's a good thing because Jesus Christ died to redeem that which was worthless so that it could have supreme value and be known to him forever. And you can trust him today. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing that it is to know you, that we do not have to live nor die in obscurity. We can be known to our creator, and he can be known to us. May we not choose obscurity, but may we come to you, step into the light, not the darkness, but step into the light of your grace and your love and your affection so that we may be known to you forever. And it's in your great name we pray. Amen.